Good morning. Welcome to All Souls Catechesis this Sunday morning. We're so glad that you could join us. It's such a strange experience um, being apart, isolated in so many respects, and yet able to come together as a community through our technology. I hope you've been able to enjoy previous week's catechesis. I was particularly struck by Deacon Mary's message last week about Easter tide, and it fits so well with uh, Father Arcadi's message that we are indeed experiencing a season of challenge. We as a community are experiencing challenge, and by community I mean all souls. We're in a time of transition, and that's always challenging, but we've added that other layer onto this of a community challenge in the form of COVID-19, the wider community, our society, our global society, is needing to meet a, a very strange and different challenge than we've ever faced before. But in the messages we heard last week, yes, we are in a season of challenge, but there is also hope. Hope in the gospel, hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week we'll be talking about St. George. Uh, St. George's Day was on Thursday, on April 23rd. Um, he is an interesting figure. His story connects us to many legends, in particular legends pertaining to dragons. And we'll see how these dragon stories, these legends, this mythology, connect to our story as well. I've titled today's uh, catechesis, Six Semper Draconis, uh, Thus Always to Dragons. It uh, is drawing upon maybe the more familiar Six Semper Tyrannis, uh, Thus Always to Tyrants. And dragons can be tyrants. As we dive into our dragon lore, uh, we'll see how George gets tied up in that dragon lore and what the backgrounds are for it. Um, we've enjoyed the illustrations of Enid Chadwick um, at, at several points in our catechesis series on the saints. Uh, we have a very dramatic illustration for George. We see him on his stallion dressed as a medieval knight carrying his shield with his particular cross on it, the red cross on a white background, which many of you will recognize as the flag of England. He is uh, contending with a dragon, and you'll see in the background the fair maiden who's tied up, who he is rescuing by contending with the dragon. Well, the question is, how did we get this lore? How is St. George connected to dragon lore? And why is he connected with Mary England? These are great questions that we want to explore. I have the collect for St. George's Day on the screen as well. I'll not walk us through that now. I will return to this slide at the end so that um, I'll read aloud and, and maybe you could read with me at home uh, the Collect of, for St. George. Um, we want to accumulate uh, ample background so that many of the points that are being made in the Collect pop out at us. I do want to qualify this by saying there is so much that could be said about George, about dragon lore, about mythology, and all of these things, but it's an onion where there's just too much onion to peel. So there's plenty I won't be talking about today. We'll not be talking about dragons from the East. Uh, we can't really get into all of the aspects of 
George and why George would come up in connection with the Crusades and evaluate the nature of the Crusades and how uh, militant Christendom went to liberate Jerusalem. We can't really talk about psychology too. It'll be lurking behind much of what we do. Um, but whenever we talk about mythology and lore of this nature, it, it really draws out a lot of internal stuff. Why do we think in terms of dragons and all of these kinds of things? There is something psychological going on there, but we just don't have time to peel the onion. We do have time, though, to talk about is a tale as old as time. And yes, that is definitely a Disney reference. In this slide, I have a picture from Disney's Sleeping Beauty. We have the knight who must slay the dragon. The dragon is the transformed Maleficent. Uh, the embodiment of evil, of malice. And Maleficent has caused Aurora, the young princess, to fall into a deep magical sleep. And she can only be awakened by love's, uh, true love's kiss. And the knight, who is uh, the one who will plant the kiss on Aurora, now must face the dragon. The dragon stands between him and Aurora. You know, Disney is on to something here. Um, it's something that is part of our cultural thinking, this dragon lore. Uh, there are so many recent movies that uh, draw this mythology out that um, I think we'll see many resonance with, with our dragon lore here. But maybe more surprising is how biblical this mythology is. Here's a painting by William Blake, Eve Tempted by the Serpent, uh, painted right around 1800. Here's Eve, center of the picture, and coiled all around her is the serpent of temptation, depicted very much like a dragon. There's so much going on in this picture. Just the creation all about her. She is the one contending with the dragon. And who's asleep over here on the side? It's Adam in that deep sleep like Aurora was. Where is Adam? Where is he in helping her contend with the dragon? Can she contend with the dragon in such a way that she will be able to get to the treasure on the other side. You know, this painting depicts in so many ways just our struggle with that eternal dragon. And what is the nature of that dragon? Is it a force outside of ourselves? Is it a force inside of ourselves? The core of who we are, fallen, sinful people, contending against a malicious opponent. It's all abundantly clear in this painting. It takes us back to Genesis. Now we can go to the other end of scripture, Revelation 12, where we get a dragon. This illuminated manuscript from the Middle Ages depicts the seven-headed dragon of Revelation 12, who opposes the woman who is about to give birth to a child, and then she does give birth to the child, and the dragon is there to eat the child. Interestingly, this illustration depicts the woman as Mary. So obviously, Mary, and the child, of course, is Christ. And she protects the child, Christ, from the dragon. The resonance between Revelation and Genesis should be very clear. Here is a woman who will contend with the dragon, and she is bearing Christ. The prophecy in Genesis 3, where the man, woman, and serpent are cursed, and we, 
we hear about this promised seed, and the serpent will nip at the heels of that seed, of that child, and the child will stomp on its head, finally defeating the dragon, the serpent. This biblical lore is fantastic. It's abundant. Perhaps you're surprised by that, that, that we have this dragon lore in our Bibles. So what does the dragon represent? Well, at one level, it represents temptation and sin that we have at our elbow. Uh, a malicious opponent constantly tempting us to sin. And yet the dragon also represents our own fallen nature. It's something within us. The devil is not necessarily the nature that is outside of us. It is the nature within us all. The dragon also represents our greatest challenge and danger. It is a dangerous world that we live in. It is a world full of viruses that are aiming to take us out at any moment. It is a world where there is enmity and strife. It is a world where we can't help but sin and harm one another. The dragon also represents the obstacle in the way of the treasure. It is the force, the challenge between where we are now and where we would like to be, whether that would be us finding that loved one that we will spend the rest of our lives with. Perhaps the treasure is that child we desperately want to have. Perhaps that treasure is uh, the work of beauty and meaning that we would like to create in the world. Perhaps that treasure is communion with God himself. There's this quote from Isaiah 27.1. In that day, the Lord, with his hand and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisting serpent, just like we saw in that Blake painting. And he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah 27, this dragon lore is everywhere in the Bible. It's fascinating. Well, look, the question is, well, how does George get connected to all of these things? Who was George in the first place? Well, the George of history really had nothing to do with dragon lore. He really was a simple man living out his faith in his area of life. George uh, lived at the end of the 200s, the third century, and on into the very beginning of the fourth century, a time of uh, pagan Roman society where the Christian church was oppressed by that Roman society. George, uh, his parents died when he was young. His father was a Roman soldier, Garantius. He died when he was 14. His mother, Polychronia, was a woman of deep faith and raised George in that faith. Well, she passed away a few years after George's father did, leaving him largely on his own. George entered the military, probably taking up his father's military commission, inheriting it, and he advanced in the military ranks to the point where he was a commander in the Roman army. He was a renowned soldier, but also a great patron of the church, especially in the Palestinian region and up into Asia Minor as well. Uh, his travels connected him to many different churches. He was a man of deep and profound faith and somebody who was a benefactor to many churches and would have been well known to many of the churches in the area. Well, Emperor Diocletian decided to persecute the Christians. He uh, felt threatened by the growing Christian church and its challenge to pagan society. And so this persecution of the Christians occurred 
at the hands of the Roman army. And so George rose up and denounced this edict to persecute the Christians. The Roman magistrates in his area were then uh, compelled to oppose him. And they brought him to trial and demanded that George sacrifice the pagan gods. If he would do that, he could be set free. He refused to sacrifice to the pagan gods, instead declared his devo devotion to the one true God in Christ Jesus. And because of this, he was tortured. There, there are stories of many different kinds of tortures that he survived miraculously. And ultimately, he was beheaded for public execution for his crimes against uh, the emperor. And his beheading is thought to have occurred on April 23rd, the day we celebrate St. George. Eusebius was a contemporary, a rough contemporary of George. And we get this account of George's uh, execution. And it's interesting to note that George remains anonymous in this. His anonymity is probably due to the fact that Eusebius is writing within the living memory of George. And the communities, or at least the family members and friends of George, may still have been under threat by uh, the authorities when he's writing this. And so he keeps George anonymous and he uses phrases like a certain man, this man to refer to a person, most of the people who would have been reading Eusebius would have known exactly who he was talking about. He says immediately on the publication of the decree against the churches in Nicomedia, a certain man, not obscure, but very highly honored with distinguished temporal dignities moved with zeal toward God and incited with ardent faith, seized the edict as it was posted openly and publicly and tore it to pieces as a profane and impious thing. And this was done while two of the sovereigns were in the same city. These are those two Roman magistrates, the oldest of all and the one who, who held the fourth place in the government after him. So this guy is really high up in the Roman uh, uh, imperial government. But this man, first in that place, after distinguishing himself in such a manner, suffered those things which were likely to follow such daring and kept his spirit cheerful and undisturbed till death. So George despite going through these trials, kept a cheerful spirit during his particular trials. Today, if you were to travel to Israel, uh, the city of Lida, or in, uh, on modern maps, you would see it written as Lod. You can go to St. George's tomb, and you can see him depicted there on a mural in his crypt. Uh, where he lies in state. So what do we learn about George? Well, first of all, he's a soldier and a hero, not just a military hero, but a hero of the faith, somebody who uh, met the challenges of his day. He uh, maintained his integrity in the face of tremendous challenge. He's a man of courageous faith. He partook in suffering and death. And this, I think, is rather important for us to connect to. Um, when we suffer in Christ, we have a special communion and connection with Christ. We follow in his footsteps. And in so doing, there's a blessedness and a meaning that comes with that. So having looked at the St. George of history, we could ask the question, how did the George of history become the George of the mythological legends connected 
with the dragon. So let's dive into this mythology. We're going to go back to ancient mythology, Greek mythology in particular, just to see that there are several stories that uh, deal with dragons. So we've seen biblical, a biblical background to the dragon lore. Here's some other stories that are percolating within that Mediterranean region. So there's the story of Cadmus of Thebes. He slays a dragon and takes the teeth of those dragon and they become the seeds of the Spartan army. Jason and the Golden Fleece. This is uh, one of the most famous stories of heroism. And there's this ever awake dragon that is, stands between him, between Jason and this golden fleece. And uh, one of the gods comes down, one of the goddesses comes down and makes the dragon fall asleep so that Jason can slip by and get the golden fleece. The story that is most similar to our George story is Perseus. He must rescue fair Andromeda from Catus, the sea dragon, the pet of Poseidon. And he, he slays that dragon and rescues Andromeda. In all of this, there's a pattern that emerges. In order to rescue something precious, in order to rescue a treasure, one must confront the dragon. Dragon must be confronted and the treasure must be of extreme value because you wouldn't confront a dragon for a trifle. The, the amount of challenge is almost um, as great as the value of the thing that you are striving for. Likewise, the battle will, it must cost you dearly. There's, it's going to take some of your flesh. It, it is going to uh, leave part of you on the battlefield in order to contend with the dragon. This is very much the story of Christ, isn't it? Uh, the, the thing of value, the treasure that he sought, uh, he was willing to lay his life down for, to confront that dragon, to defeat that dragon on our behalf. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And what did he accomplish in that? The very salvation of our souls, the creation of a new people of God. There are two Raphael paintings that I want to focus in on. One is this Raphael, the resurrection of Christ, completed in 1502. And there's a lot going on in this picture. Um, it's not a, a cave with a big rock in front of it. This resurrection has a sarcophagus or, or a crypt, and, and the top is moved aside, and the resurrected Christ is above it with angels ministering to him, and you can see the ladies in, in the background. And there are these four men. Well, who is at the resurrection? Well, it's four soldiers from the four corners of the globe. Raphael is thinking through, well, how do we reconcile militant Christianity <clears throat> and the resurrection of Christ? <clears throat> and um, he notes that these four different representatives of the four corners of the globe come together to the resurrected Christ. Even with their weaponry and their protective gear, they are coming together. The people of God come together. Now, Raphael really only traveled Italy, and so much of their costume is Italianate. Uh, he, he tries to get in a, a somewhat Eastern garb here to represent maybe a more remote culture. We might not paint this the same way if we're trying to represent 
the four corners of the globe coming together to become the people of God, uh, to become the people surrounding the resurrected Christ. There's a few other features that I'd like to focus in on, it, details from this Raphael. The first is a serpent defeated down in the um, lower left-hand corner of the painting is this serpent. Elsewhere in the picture are these cranes who are the enemies of serpents. They kill serpents and snakes. The defeated serpent occurs as this metaphor in Raphael's resurrection of Christ. The other thing is the flag that Jesus is holding. Is that St. George's flag? It's the red cross on a white background. That's quite stunning, isn't it? That Christ would be holding George's flag at his resurrection. So we see our themes depicted in this painting of the resurrection. The dragon is defeated. The treasure is won in those people from the four corners of the globe coming together. The cost was extreme. He endured the cross and the shame and the death, and yet he won. He defeated the dragon and now lives at the right hand of God. Raphael painted another uh, painting, this time with St. George and the dragon. Only four years, four years or so after he completed the previous painting. Perhaps this gives us a sense that St. George was on his mind. That's why Jesus is holding the St. George flag. We have here the defeat of the dragon. And here he wins the treasure, the fair maiden over there in, on the right-hand side. Christ wins for himself his bride, the church. And I think this kind of analogy is behind why George, soldierly George, becomes caught up in the dragon lore of the Middle Ages to depict something like um, Christ dying or, or contending with the dragon for the sake of the church, his loved one. Well, with the time we have remaining, I want to connect this to our story. We are people who are contending with many things. What are the dragons that we are facing? There are so many in our world, it's difficult to enumerate them all. Ways in which we have been potentially victimized or oppressed by others. Ways in which we don't see politics solving the problems that we as Christians would want to be solved. Military conflict, viruses. Our world is full of danger. It is not a safe place for people in general. It's certainly not a safe place for something as fragile and precious as faith. Well, how does the cross equip us? How shall we wield the word when the Lord speaks about his strong hand and his sword? How do we wield this effectively to face the dragons that we meet in our world? And what today is the treasure of great price? These questions confront us as we face our dragons today. We are also isolated from one another. This social distancing can make us feel alone and it can make us feel powerless to meet the challenges that we're facing. But the message of George is that we are not powerless. Even when we're alone, we have powerful tools at our disposal, whether that be prayer, reading scripture, attending church together through the means that we can uh, to commune with one another, in our services online. The story of St. George, the legend of St. George, is our story. We can put complete trust in the power 
of the resurrected Christ, just as George did when confronting his own challenge in the Roman Empire, we can face our own challenges in this world of coronavirus, in our own situation where we're facing a transition as a church. We can have unwavering conviction in the truth of our faith. Our faith doesn't go unchallenged in in the public sphere, and yet we can stand up to those challenges. We can ask questions about how chaplaincy can work in hospitals today to meet with people who are struggling spiritually in light of coronavirus. We can win the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the message Paul presents to us, There are things worth contending for as Christians as we face this world. And we can take George as our emblem. Our community enjoys special moments. I got this picture, it's a little blurry, of one of our Hallmark days, the blessing of the animals on St. Francis Day. And St. George's flag, you might not have noticed this, but St. George's flag flies over us as a church. Because we are Anglican, yes. Because of our connection with England, sure. But also because St. George is important to us. St. George represents something of us as a community. We are a community who contend with the realities of a fallen world. We do things like go to Kenya to support a school. We do things like trying to welcome refugees in our community. We are contenders just like George was, standing up for what we believe in. When I taught about St. Andrew Andrew last Uh, fall. I mentioned some of the intricacies of the Union Jack, the connection of Andrew's flag with George's flag. For now, I want to focus this in on George's flag. I think George's flag can be our banner, something that we can rally around together. As a community, all souls is going through a really tough 2020. But we can face the dragons. We can be a unified people rallying under this banner, supporting one another, being the body of Christ together. I want to conclude by bringing back this colic of St. George, the martyr, I'll read it aloud, slowly and carefully, so that if you would so uh, like to do this, you can follow along with me. Almighty God, you gave your servant George boldness to confess the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, before the rulers of this world, and courage to die for his faith. Grant that we may always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us and to suffer gladly for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. If you've enjoyed the lore, I wanted to leave you with a few resources. Uh, There's a great book for children called St. George and the Dragon, retold by Margaret Hodges and illustrated by Trina Schart-Hyman. Cameron and I, my my son, we really enjoyed reading this. Um, It's a a great retelling. When we say retelling, uh, if you want to get into the medieval story that really got the story going for England, uh, you can read book one of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. 
There's a few more recent retellings, sort of, of these dragon tales. C.S. Lewis, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader in the Chronicles of Narnia, depicts Eustace Scrub, who becomes a dragon, and his life becomes transformed as he tries to stop being a dragon. And then finally, uh, Tolkien's uh, dragon tale. You might know The Hobbit and Smog the Dragon in there. Here's another uh, more whimsical dragon tale, Farmer Giles of Ham. Uh, it's, it's somewhat uh, an updated version of the Georgian and the dragon tale. These might be interesting things for you to read on your own, particularly if you're socially isolated for the foreseeable future. Well, thank you all for spending this time with me going through George and the dragons. I hope there's a message here for you to cling to during uh, these times of trials and that we do have a great hope. Thank you. Have a blessed day.